Good day to everyone. Welcome to War Civilization 2 from 1500 to the present. In today's uh, lecture, we're going to continue in a way the discussion we had last week about this transition from the 19th century to the 20th century. Well, last week uh, we focused uh, more on the dynamics of colonialism, of nationalism too, uh, the economic developments that led uh, to the second industrial revolution, mostly in, in our Western Europe. Today we're gonna see uh, three new facets of um, this transition. And I want for you to think about it as in a way, uh, the setting that allowed the happening of, that allowed World War, World War I to happen. Uh, that uh, first uh, worldwide confrontation is gonna be our focus uh, next week, and it's one of the big events when we talk about world history. So I want for you to have in mind these three topics I mentioned to you. It has to do with the emergence of new social groups, and new social identities and reivindications linked to women, linked to migration. It has to do with the emergence of modernism and the cultural facets of this uh, gigantic transformation in the world of the 19th century. Uh, similarly to what we discussed up a couple of weeks ago of these cultures of splendor, of the enlightenment in China, in India, when present day India, in Europe, in the Americas, it's a, very similar, it's a very similar discussion as we are gonna be seeing uh, the cultural representation and manifestation of this industrialism of the 19th century. And also, um, we are gonna be seeing a more like the rivalries, both economic and geopolitical among European powers um, that help us understand World War I. So let's start. Uh, so as every week, I want for you to have in mind three ideas, to have in mind three ideas about the topics we're discussing, okay? This unsettled war is, is the title you can find in the test book, which was from 1890 to 1940, and it's an unsettled war because it's in a way uh, the true oil that followed those 19th century transformations uh, we've been discussing the last couple of weeks and how they then led to first World War I and then World War II and all uh, its ramifications in 20th century war history. We're gonna be seeing how these rivalries actually later are gonna be very helpful to understand, for instance, the Cold War. So what are those three basic ideas? The first, I want for you to think of um, a couple of social phenomena happening in this turn from the 19th to the 20th century. In particular, we're gonna be seeing three and see how they manifest themselves. We're gonna be talking about population movement, migration, right? Probably today, you know more migration because of people coming uh, from the third world countries to countries like the United States and Europe, right? But if you look at migration at the beginning of the 20th century and the late 19th century, it has to do more with Europeans going to other places. So we're gonna be seeing how that migration worked. It has to do with financial crisis, okay? We're gonna be seeing how economic development in the world was transforming from this industrial, the second industrial revolution in Northwestern Europe we discussed last week, to the emergence of big banks and what were the role of banking in the making of this financial capitalism that we live in today. And it has also to do with the rise of women consciousness, okay? The, the, the role of women in society and also uh, the significance of gender in shaping social relations is gonna be very important uh, to understand this transformation in the late 19 and uh, late 19 and early 20th century. The, cent the second I want for you to have in mind, it has to do with power rivalries, okay? Mostly among European countries. So they were fighting among themselves, but they also were facing protests against colonial domination, which is going to undermine Europe's dominant position in the world. And this is very important, as I was telling you, because it has to do with the development of World War I. Right? And then how World War I led to World War II, 
and how they're linked significantly with the rise of the United States as a global hegemon, right? Uh, so how this transformation from Europe to United States in terms of uh, global domination has to do with this particular period. And the last topic has to do with new forms of scientific thinking, of artistic expression, right? Which is what we are going to be calling today modernism. So what I want for you to have in mind about modernism is two things. The first is that they were challenging the dominant Western view of progress um, dominant in Europe and North America, right? So one of the big uh, promises of the 19th century is that this massive economic development, this massive improvement in production because of industrialism was going to lead to a better society, right? This idea of progress, the idea where we go from point A to point B, right? And point B is always going to be better than point A. So what modernism is going to bring to the discussion is that that was not the case. That that's where actually there were acute social uh, contradiction links to class relation, links to gender relation, links to race relation, to colonialism, uh, which actually make us doubt progress. And the second is that these ideas in Europe and North America uh, that we are calling today modernism, had a lot to do with the achievements of not, not non-Western societies, right? So what this means is that we cannot understand this new cultural representation and manifestation of this convoluted war of the 19th century without seeing the flux, the cultural flux from the colonies to um, cloned countries like France or um, Germany, Belgium, and others in Europe. So, these cultural flourishments, as we discussed it in the case of the black men a couple of weeks ago, had to do a lot with Western societies actually taking control of non-Western society and incorporating some elements of their culture. So let's start with the first uh, section. The social conflicts emerging in the late 19th century, remember, you have to do a lot to understand this period of wars, which is starting 1914 with World War I and then goes all the way to 1945 with World War II and its ramifications with the Cold War, right? So the first social conflict has to do with economic growth and inequality, right? So what we can see in the late, in the late 19th century, and in a way I already mentioned this uh, last week, is a larger concentration of capital that made possible more intense in forms of agriculture and more mechanized form of manufacturing, okay? So these were fueling economic growth. What does it mean? We're uh, looking at expansion of industrial ways of production all over the world, right? And more capital intensive way of extracting certain uh, commodities. Uh, so we can talk, for instance, about the rubber boom in the Amazon, uh, also, the rubber exploitation in what today is uh, the Congo Democratic Republic. It has to do also, remember, we talk about this, but I want for you to have in mind that this is still happening about sugar. Like, slave based plantations in Cuba actually were in place until the 1870s and even 1880s, likewise in, in Brazil. So, we're going to see is like the way. Like the form of capitalism that we characterize in, as industrial and capital intensive is taking over the world. It's taking over the world both within countries such as England, right, such as France that are going to become industrial centers, Germany in a way too, but it's also becoming dominant in peripheral regions where uh, this kind of uh, uh, primary resources, commodities, natural resources are extracted, such as rubber in the Amazon, but also uh, the exportation of commodities as coffee, as tobacco, as sugar, and others. So this is taking over the world. But at the same way, is producing this advanced capitalism, is producing inequalities, right? And this is the first thing I want for you to have in mind, is that economic growth in the history of capitalism since early in the 17th century with merchant capitalism, with the slaves and sugar and silver, all these things we've discussed so far, always goes with growing inequality, right? So the more developed is capitalism, the more like deeper 
the social inequality between the richest, richest portion of the population and the poorest portions of the population um, happen, right? So this is going to happen within industrial countries. So this is very important. It's not just the division between industrialized and not industrialized countries. We also have growing uh, social class conflicts in industrial con uh, countries like England. I will already talk about the rise of the bourgeoisie, but also the emergency, uh, the emergence of the proletariat as an antagonist class of the bourgeoisie, right? And how the people who were working in the factories actually have very acute conflict with the people who own the factories. So we're going to see this division basically, or mostly as a social class division within these industrialized countries like England. But also we're going to find a difference between the worst industrial and non-industrial regions, right? So the places where manufacturing is happening and clothes are produced, but also where capital goods are produced and all this kind of stuff, like England and other European countries, like later the United States, are going to be creating a very deep gap with countries in Latin America, in Asia, in, um, in Africa, uh, basically because of what we already discussed, that was the international division of labor. So just to summarize, have in mind economic growth under capitalist, uh, under a capitalist mode of production, always is going to generate inequality. And this inequality is going to generate social conflict, sometimes war, sometimes other kind of stuff. We are also going to see in this period the emergence not just of giant banks, but also of huge industrial corporations that cause alarm for it seem to sign an end to free markets and competitive capitalism. So we already have seen how laissez-faire liberalism, laissez-faire capitalism championed by the, uh, by the British since early in the 19th century was at the center of this early development of 19th century capitalism. But here we're going to be uh, seeing the emergence of the big conglomerates, right? Just to give you an example, look at the history of Standard Oil. Right? Standard Oil was probably the largest uh, company that ever existed in the United States that monopolized the production of oil, the extraction, production, and transportation of oil, on oil, of oil all over the world. And it was so monopolistic that the United States government in the early 20th century decided to break it down into more than five or six different companies. But they actually had control, standard oil, of a very large portion of the oil industry all over the world. This is where the Rockefeller family comes from. You probably hear about it. Um, and, and the, the patriarch of the company, the first Rockefeller, actually was one of the richest person ever in history, not just in his lifetime. So we are going, we're going to see how the ide ideologies of free markets of the 19th century are going to be in conflict with actual monopolism of certain industries. This is going to happen with banks. This is going to happen with um, mostly in the beginning oil, but there you can see a very similar pattern with the automobile industry for and others. And what happened with the banks? That banks seem in need for a closer government supervision, but public institutions did not yet have the resources to protect all investment during this time of economic crisis. So what we're going to see in this period is growing economic enterprise, private enterprise, who are uh, every time or every moment more difficult to be regulated by the public government, by national governments. And when you have so big corporations, so big banks operating all over the world, as is, is in this time, it's very difficult to regulate them. And why regulation is very important? Because this is going to be closely connected with the Great Depression of 1921, probably one of the biggest and most uh, more effectful um, economic and financial crisis in the last couple of centuries, right? And that's going to shape uh, public policy all over the world. And regulation is going to be at the center, right? When uh, FDR, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president of the United States, and he proposed the New Deal, was actually a way of regulating 
these big banks and big corporations that were uh, taking over um, the domestic market and international market, that's just domestic market in the US, to control them to save capitalism. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks, but the creation of these banks are going to be closely connected with the economic crisis of 1921. And actually there were um, crises before 1921 that in a way showed us uh, the possible uh, situation that was going to happen, right? We have the 1893 crisis when 15, 550 American banks collapsed, but we also have the 1907 uh, crisis that caused a lot of panic on Wall Street and the banking system in the US. So we have a series of financial crises that are building up to the 1929th Great Depression and are closely connected to it. Also, one larger uh, conflict emerging in this period is migration, right? But it's migration from Europe. So what we're going to see, and we're going to see this since the mid 19th century until after the end of Second World War, is that millions of Europeans migrated to North America, to Australia, to Latin America, in Latin America, mostly under China and Cuba, and also to Africa. And the United States was the favorite destination alongside Argentina. So why do we have this large uh, migration of Europeans? It has to do with the expansion of the agricultural production industry in countries uh, like uh, in Latin America, for instance, like Argentina, Brazil, and Cuba, right? So in Brazil and Cuba, and in the United States also in a way, it has to do with a very particular issue. Remember that coffee production and sugar production in Brazil, as well as sugar and coffee production in Cuba, were based on slave labor. But the slavery was abolished in both countries by the end of the 19th century, right? So what happened is that million, million of peasants from countries uh, in Europe became the new labor force for agricultural production, right? For instance, there was thousands and thousands of, of Italian families who traveled to Argentina, but they also traveled to Brazil to work in coffee plantations, among others. So what we have here is a labor migration or labor migrants, right? And usually, when we think of labor migrants, we think, for instance, of Latino families uh, coming from a lot of countries in, in, in Latin America to the United States to work uh, in farms in California in the mid 20th century, or uh, like these kind of engagements, for instance, in ranchos, in ranch in, in, te in Texas and others. So we used to think of Latin Americans as labor migrants in the United States. What we don't remember is that actually this is a pretty recent phenomenon happening principally after the second half of the 20th century. In the 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century, what we have is Europeans migrating because they weren't able to find work in their own countries, right? And until 1914, this is very important, governments impose almost no controls on immigration or emigration, okay? If in a country like the United States, we come to think that actually migration has always been a very protected and and here at issue in national politics, because it is right now, right? Uh, we have Trump's talking about the wall to divide the United States and Mexico. We have uh, the scandal of ICE right now separating families on the Mexican US border. And all these kinds of discussion uh, kind of sh uh, show us that immigration and particularly illegal immigration as a big issue in the United States, right? But that was not the case in 1914 and even before, right? Um, it was just until World War I that restriction started. Before that, there was a very easy entry movement. If you haven't done this, I really recommend for you to go to Ellis Island Museum. Uh, I don't know if it's open right now because of the pandemic, uh, but it's a very interesting place because that's where most European migrants, immigrants coming to United States have to go through, right? And you can see a lot of histories of these people migrating from all over Europe and parts of Asia into the United States, why they come, how they look. So it's a very um, useful way to see how migration has been transformed in the late, um, since the late 19th century, right? 
actually the first restriction ever imposed in the US to migration was um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which was affected mostly because of my, a Chinese migration to, to the Pacific coast, mostly California and other places, but mostly uh, California, which had a huge uh, population of Chinese people. Uh, that was the first time and up, uh, from that moment up throughout the 20th centuries where we can see these violent restrictive immigration policies imposing in the United States. And the third topic in relationship to these social conflicts emerging has to do with what in the time they call the women question and what we call today more uh, the implication of gender right relations in shaping modern societies. So we already have struggles over social inequality, right? That we already saw with this financial crisis, with migration um, and, and the economic growth propelled by capitalist uh, production. But there was also the increasingly urgent issue of how women fit into the world's rapidly changing economic and societies, right? What was the role of women? Remember that we're talking of a moment and like a point, we're talking about a point in history where mostly, or almost anywhere in the world, uh, women had the vote to write, women had the, war, uh, the, the right, had the right to vote, had the right to, to hold property, had the right to go to school. There was actually, even though today uh, there is still a lot of exclusion and discrimination based on gender, is not we're not talking exactly about the same because most of um, the rights that women have today, thanks to feminist movements since the late 19th century, were not in place in this in this moment. That's what I show you. This uh, who has to do with the very acute struggle of women in countries in, in Europe and in the United States too, North America in general, to vote. And actually voting rights were at the center. Uh, just to give you an example, I'm from Colombia and in Colombia just in the 1950s, women were given the, vote to right, the right to vote. So it's a very late issue. And in this conflicting setting of late 19th century war societies, women, the women, the what they call the women question, become very important. So in countries of the West, in Western Europe, in North America, where we're going to see the female advocates were demanding that women be given more rights as citizens and more radical voices, call for fundamental changes to the family and the larger society, right? We have here the four critiques of the separation between public life and private life, between the household and the factory, right? Between the production and the reproduction of the labor of the, of the force um, and labor. And women are starting in this point in history to point out to this, all those inequalities that are based on gender relations. But also in countries in Africa and the Middle East and India, for women, colonialism added to their borders. So one thing that Western and European uh, politicians used to say, for instance, when they talk about Middle Eastern countries, is like, oh no, see how difficult the situation for women is there. And that, they argue, has to do with uh, true radical Islamic governments that are imposing um, things on women that actually women in the Western world uh, don't have to suffer those, um, those discrimination, right? And that's the, the colonial discourse that still exists about it. What they don't show you is that actually that situation in countries, that situation for women in countries in the Middle East and Africa doesn't have a lot to do with these so-called Islamic radical governments, for instance. Uh, that it has to do with the colonial history of the region. It has to do with, um, with the heteronorm, for instance, in certain, in most of Middle Eastern countries by English and French colonists, right? And they give you, for instance, the example of Iran and how complicated the situation is uh, with Iran for women and these kind of things. What they don't tell you is that the 1917 Iranian revolution had a lot to do with U.S. intervention in national issues of Iran. So it's not just about how religion, as they say, 
shape um, women's situation in these countries, for instance, in Africa and the Middle East. It has to do with the colonial situation and it has to do with the huge responsibility that Britain, France, Belgium, the United States have in the way in which uh, women are treated in these countries today. So I always think I want for you when we talk about different dynamics of oppression of discrimination to think about the connections you can establish among them, right? So how gender relations, for instance, or, or discrimination based on gender is closely tied, linked, connected to colonialism and how colonialism is also uh, connected with the making of ideas of race and nationality. So all these things are always connected, right? The second topic I mentioned for you, mentioned to you at the beginning, has to do with these growing rivalries among European countries and also the growing anti-colonial struggle against, um, against European countries. So remember that we've seen different uh, cycles of colonization in, in our class. We saw one first led by uh, Spaniards and Portuguese who came to America to control of what today is America. Then the British also came, the Dutch, the French, um, and they con took control of America. Then we have in the early 19th century, the wars of independence and all colonial uh, structures and in a way expelled. But European colonialism doesn't stop there. It just moves away, right? Then we have the colonization of Southeast Asia. We have the colonization, more importantly, of Africa. And this colonialism is going to work way different because in the case of America, we have a regime in place for almost, uh, for almost 300 years, right? In this, and in, since the 16th century. In this case, we're talking about 19th and 20th century colonialism. Uh, which uh, was linked morally, most, uh, more childly to the extraction of certain natural resources in Africa. It has to do with empire rivalries and geopolitics. Why is this important? Because anti-colonial resistance has everything to do with World War I, right? We're going to be discussing this in ex like extensively next week, but World War I has to do a lot uh, with the rivalries among European, Europe, uh, European countries once they had divided among them the whole world, right? So what else was left to control and what happened with this country that didn't have co colonies, but this country did have. So all these colonization dynamics and growing anti-colonial resistance is going to be critical in the years before World War I. Also, because the cycles of anti-colonial resistance and colonial repression escalated and intensified, right? We're going to be seeing uh, the appearance of armed movements, of armed struggle, for instance, in countries in Africa to expel French colonialists, right? And this is going to happen among, uh, along Asia and Africa, right? And the way in which this anti-colonial struggle face colonial powers and colonial powers in like confronting each other, I insist, is fundamental to understand why World War I happened. And when we talk about European rivalries, it has to do mostly with the rise of an European center war, right? That deepened rivalries within Europe, right? It was just not about the contradiction with the colonial possession. It was also the tensions that increased within Europe as the European state competed for raw materials and colonial footholds, right? Uh, so we're going to see again how they were fighting to, for instance, take control of markets in one today's India that end up being controlled by the um, British, of taking control of, uh, uh, of the Chinese domestic market, right? We're going to see also, for instance, how Japan became a huge colonial power in the Southeast, right? They invaded China, they invaded uh, Korea. So as powers were taking control of different regions of the world, they were also um, competing among themselves for raw materials and colonial footballs, right? And we're going to see, very important, the first massive arms race, right? 
again, all this building up to World War I. So what happened is, as conflict among European countries were escalating, countries like Britain, Germany, France, and Russia, entering what, what we call the first massive arms race. We, you, you, we mostly know about the arms race linked to the Cold War, right? In the 20th century, but we was actually the first one in which, remember, we're talking about industrial production. And industrial production starts to be applied to the production of guns and weaponry in general, which entirely transformed the way in which wars uh, worked. So these imperial rivalries, again, are going to be fundamental to understand World War II. World War I. And let's go to the last topic, which has to do the cultural representation, right? And the cultural manifestation of this convoluted war of the late 19th century. So we have revolutionaries and reforming wrestling within crushing social and economic tensions, right? We saw it already at the beginning of this pre-recorded lecture. But what I want for you to see now is how intellectual artists and scientists also began to recognize that the new cultural war along with the new century was dawning. So the they were recognizing the cultural transformation brought about by industrialism, by colonialism, by the expansion of capitalism and the financial uh, system that was uh, starting to uh, bring the world together, right? And that is what we call modernism. What is modernism? The sense of having broken with tradition. The sense that is, this is a new era that very similar to what the French revolutionaries felt until after 1789, right? After they, they put in place uh, this massive uh, social, political, cultural revolution in France, it was the sense of breaking up with tradition. So this modernism is going uh, to change the way in which science works, physics, uh, architecture, but also painting and the social science. We're going to be seeing the emergence of positivism. We're going to be seeing the emergence of the big thinkers in different social science. Remember, this is also the time Darwin is writing about evolution, right? Very close to the time Marx is talking about capitalism, uh, that uh, Marx Weber, one of the most important sociologists in history, is writing also about these modern societies. Uh, anthropology is born, right? So it's all this kind of social science, for instance, that we know today uh, are, are being shaped in this late 19th century, but also architecture change. There's a big gap between, let's say, the Baroque architecture of Spain, uh, than what we could, could call this modernist architecture, most, more focusing urbanism, urbanization. And, and this idea that as the cities grew, we had to transform the way in which we inhabit the cities. We're talking about uh, expansion of buildings instead of, instead of houses. There is a lot of new uh, dynamics in architecture, but also in physics, but also in chemistry. And we can all bring them together under this idea of modernism, that they have the idea of being broken with tradition, with the past. And you have to think, you have to remember that it's very uh, logical for them to be thinking that. We're talking about the period in which uh, we're transitioning from a rural-based so rural society to urban-based society. We're transitioning from a socialist structure based on castes to a social structure by your social classes, uh, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, we already have discussed, but there's a lot of transformation and artists are starting to catch up. And one manifestation of this uh, new modernism has to do with popular culture, right? What is popular culture? Uh, the production and consumption of art, books, music, and sport then change due to technological innovation, literacy rate increase, and other factors. So it's basically when culture and art became massive. And how it became massive? Again, remember we're talking about industrial production. And one of the foremost, and uh, first and foremost uh, important characteristic of industrial production is that it's, it's a massive production, right? So it's not just, you have the Mona Lisa, for instance, right? It's in, uh, in, in the museum in Paris. But you can 
easily find the Mona Lisa online. You can go to a bookstore and find a painting of the Mona Lisa of you know, a lot of these art works art and uh, before this period were unique because simply the painter painted and that was the only copy we had. Now this uniqueness of art is being reversed because of popular culture and of massive production of art because we can infinitely reproduce the very same thing because of technology. So this entirely changed the cultural field. And as it was uh, massive, what we're going to say is that these forms of art are now accessible to the masses, right? And the, the, the most, like the easiest way to see this in the 19th century is to talk about the press, which by the 19th century constitute the major form of popular entertainment and information. <coughs> Why was the press so important? I want for you to think about this. How many times do you use in a day Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or all the social networking we have today, right? How do you inform yourselves about political situation, economic situation, or movies, or uh, the new documentary post published and produced by uh, Netflix, or this new movie you like, this new, um, play you want to see, the playing in Broadway, and so on and so forth. All this information today, we get it from the internet. We get it from Facebook, from Instagram, from Twitter. It's the way in which we inform ourselves about politics, about society, about entertainment, right? It's all uh, linked to this, uh, to this massive transformation that represents the internet, but also technology. That we have cell phones, that we have laptops, we have tablets, and all these kind of things. But none of this existed in the late 19th century. So what for you, what Facebook is for you today, for people in the 19th century, that role was, um, was filled, fulfilled by the press, by newspapers, by journals. If you ever take a newspaper from the late 19th century, you're going to see they would show information about everything. You could know about what was being discussed in Congress, about the la latest movie, about the latest play in Broadway, about uh, the latest scientific uh, development, what was happening with the war in Europe in 1914 when World War I uh, broke out, uh, but also about entertainment, also about buying and selling stuff, right? Uh, if you wanted to, to sell your house, the best way for you to do that was to put an announcement in the newspaper. And also became fundamental for politics, right? What you have here is the appearance of cartoons. This is from a newspaper in Mexico. You can see uh, how it represents the kind of social conflicts that were being disputed in, this, in that moment. So remember, for instance, the heated discussion in the 2016 election, uh, about the role of Facebook in electoral politics in the US, right? When there's even a trial uh, against some Trump's advisors because of this. Um, so all these kind of debates in the late 19th century took place in newspapers. And newspapers were becoming massive, were becoming massive first because technological innovation allowed for them to be massive because the printing press were becoming faster and more effective, but also because we have increasing literary rates, right? So people was able to read. But we're going to see another manifestation of popular culture then with radio and TV. For instance, radio. Radio became very important in rural areas in Latin America uh, because people was not able to read, right? So you cannot take the newspaper. So what radio start, radio station start doing was reading out loud newspaper for people using radio, and they, all they had to do was to listen, right? And anyone could listen. So this kind of transformation of popular culture that today we see in Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, it started actually with a newspaper, it's actually with a radio station. So that's why this is so important. And lastly, the last topic I want for you to have in mind today that I want to talk to you about today has to do with the connection between race and nation, the connection between two ideas. 
Because by the end of the 19th century, we can see that racial roots had become a crucial part of national identity, right? We saw how early it was more important. Uh, it had to do about religion. It had to do about church tradition and history. Language was fundamental. But now we have uh, the idea that certain race corresponds uh, correspond with certain nations, right? But we also are talking about the period in which white superiority as, an pow as a powerful ideology was emerging all over the world, right? It's, it's in this way, for instance, that Jim Crow policies were able in the United States. So this was the era, to take to, for you to have an example, of ethnographic museum for folkloric collector racial genealogies, right? It was the time in which anthropology as a social science was born, mostly to understand the other, the indigenous, the black, the one that was not white, the one that was not European. And they start collecting um, ethnographic objects all over the world. There's actually a huge debate right now in the, came from, in the field of museology uh, because of the effects of colonialism in the making of museology as a discipline. So if you go to the Met, the Met is amazing. I love the museum, of course. You go to the Egyptian section and you can see the mummies and you can see even portions of the wall like directly taken out uh, from the pyramids. But what don't they tell you, what they don't tell you is that all that is a stolen um, patrimony, it's a stolen works of art, right? So those countries from which these kind of pieces were stolen, now telling uh, European and, and North American museums is we want our patrimony back. So colonialism again has to do a well with that. And the preoccupation with race reflected a worldwide landing for fixed root in an unsettled world, right? It has to do a lot with identity and how people identify, identify themselves, right? Uh, it, when World War I uh, broke out, Lenin, well, the great leader of the Russian Revolution, and all of on other communist and social democrat leaders uh, all, across Europe expected workers to actually say, we're not, we're not going to this war, we are workers together, uh, regardless of national borders. But that's not what to happen, right? The English workers went to war to fight uh, with the French workers, with the German workers, with the Austrian workers. Like, actually, national identity was way more powerful than social base kind, like social class based identities. Um, so it has to do with this making of identities, but also because we're going, um, we're talking about uh, an, a period of world history with, where a variety of, variety of nationalism and pan-ethnic movements uh, emerge, right? So have this in, mind, this in mind again for the time when we talk about World War I, because we're talking about, for instance, pan-Arabic identities, right? And how this shaped the world, well, the, the way in which middle, the Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern politics work out today. So let's just wrap it up with two conclusions. The first is this, uh, this is a period of doubt over progress, right? So urbanization, industrialization seem very disrupting and uplifting, more than disorienting and restoring, right? So we have big transformations linked to urbanization, industrialization, but they are constantly generating doubts about the way in which they're actually making um, the world a better place to live in, right? This idea of progress that if you go from point A from point B, point B is always going to be better. But we also have colonized people resistance to this civilizing mission. So we are going, we're starting to see how these Western European based project of civilizing the war, of conquering the war, of saying that what was better for them was better for the rest of the war, it's actually crumbled into pieces. It's actually been strongly criticized by politicians, by uh, social leaders, uh, by artists, intellectuals, scientists. A lot of people are showing doubts of their progress. But this anxiety is also stimulated creative energy and experimental thinking that found expression in modernism, right? 
But remember, Western artists borrowed non-Western images and vocabularies, okay? So what this means is modernism cannot just be seen as a phenomenon happening in North America and Europe without having in mind colonialism, right? Because colonialism became an easy way for Europeans and North Americans to actually borrow these people's culture without actually having to deal with the people uh, in itself, right? How you bring uh, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art works of art from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia, but you deny that people from those countries actually come in, right? So that's the way in which colonialism actually shaped cultural representation and artistic uh, constructions, right? So this is all for today. Uh, this, this and last week's uh, pre-recorded lecture in a way was were a way to, to understand this 19th century capitalism and how it, it's going to fall down with World War I, which is what we're going to be discussing uh, next week. So I'll see you all next week.